Welcome to The C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about freelancing. I'm Jen Mathiasen, an objects conservative based in South Yorkshire. I'm Chloe Rumsey, an objects conservative based in Greater Manchester. And I'm Christina Rizek, an objects conservator based in Cambridgeshire. Woohoo! Okay, uh, before we start talking about freelancing, does anyone have any news? I've got some really kind of random news. It's not news as such, but it's just something um, that amused me and I thought other people might be interested. So I am uh, uh, an amateur, what they call perfumista, uh, in that I'm really interested in and collect perfumes and fragrances and stuff in a mild way i've i finally got re- around to trying some of um this range that uh, is based on an american range made by a company called demeter but they they also sell them in boots in the uk which is a chain of uk pharmacies for our overseas listeners and um in the uk they're sold as library of fragrance so i bought a load of them and I'm, I'm sharing this because I think these are choices that only a conservator would make. Oh, please so come. I've got um, one called Paperback, oh. uh, which aims to recreate the smell of old paperbacks and paperback bookshops. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and in fact, weirdly, in the description, they actually mention the research that's been done with the artificial nose at um, UCL at the Institute for Sustainable Heritage. So um, that's quite cool. Um, You know, where they they developed an artificial nose to kind of sniff volatile compounds in the air and kind of try and work out whether books are degrading just based on their smell. Um, So I've got one called Paperback. I've got one called Holy Water, which aims to recreate the fragrance of an old church, sort of cool stone and a bit of wax and flowers and stuff like that. That's amazing. I'm trying to think what the other conservation-y ones. There's lots of kind of like leathery ones and... And wood ones and so on. Um, so I thought I would just share that because Aww. I guess I'm not the only conservator who kind of loves the smells of conservation and objects um, and even the quite kind of weird ones. <laughs> Sadly, like a week after I finally got around to buying some, they've discontinued them in the UK. Oh. Um, so they're not they're, they're quite kind of limited in availability this is a funny <laughs> parallel christina because i used to be a perfume reviewer uh for mm-hmm. black phoenix alchemy lab which does a lot of weird perfumes in america and cool. um, so actually i used to review perfumes very esoteric weird ones and uh, i mm-hmm. love the sound of all the ones that you've talked about so i just thought that was a okay. really funny parallel and i love it uh <laughs> that's really 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 great also by the way people do scented candles that are um what what's it called a uh, bibliophile themed so they smell like old books or new books or oh. that sort of thing they're on etsy by the way so if anyone's interested i can pop a link in <laughs> amazing please do um i um I've, I've just remembered that one of the most famous ones that they do in the fragrance library um is um there's one called dirt <laughs> and there's one yes. called dust oh my um, god I, I haven't I haven't smelt those myself but i do have the one that's called fireplace which is quite a realistic kind of it's not a it's not a burning kind of woody smoky kind of smell it's very much the smell of dead ashes in the fireplace oh my god um, oh yeah uh, one of my favorites used to be one called antique lace which is you blimey know, yeah uh, just yeah kind of old old linen cupboard smell but you know it's interesting yeah. oh i see they do they also do one called glue oh what, <laughs> what kind of glue it's a pva it's gonna be i don't PVA. know I let's don't hope know. it's not and, and there are some things <laughs> there are some things that are quite kind of um there are some really characteristic conservation smells aren't there um, oh i mean God. personally because i've used it a lot um the smell of cdd cyclododicate <laughs> is completely unmistakable <laughs> to, to reference me. back to our hazards episode <laughs> Yeah, smell that well, I mean, yes, exactly. Shouldn't be smelling it, but there you go. But, uh, it, it, CDD is to me what Madeleine's were to Proust. So there you go. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> is there one called Naphthalene? <laughs> uh, Jesus, funnily be. enough, no. I don't mm. know if there's a, like a mothballs one or something like that. Oh. Camphor, no. Um, although, you know, those are kind of notes that you do get in perfumes as well so uh, there is rubber oh um, and sawdust oh wow uh, tarnish interestingly which i'm assuming is that kind of really cold metallic smell yeah. that you get mm. oh fascinating i might actually have to to spend a fortune importing some things from the u.s or if any of our u.s listeners would like to send some to the c word hq then we would like to review really want... it officially please <laughs> yeah oh my god that would be amazing can i do a can i do yes a i'm dead serious yes. about this please this is do happening that. 
<laughs> Everyone, we'd, right, okay. we'd love it if you imported some of these weird perfumes, please. Oh, please yes. Contact Christina or the C word generally. Yep. Yes. It's be amazing. Yep. Yes. We're starting something. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Oh, that's so amazingly niche. I absolutely love it. That's really great. So while we've been talking, I've just looked them up and they actually do one called The Curator. Oh. What? This is this is Black Phoenix Phoenix Alchemy Lab. Oh, I, I, that um, one's so, not one I've tried. <laughs> I'm itching to no. try it now. <laughs> it says, uh, <laughs> The Curator features mysterious ancient spices and resins. <clears throat> um, and the notes, the main notes that are supposed to be in it are resin... Uh, not the B seventy two type, the the kind of mysterious frankincense type, uh, spices and uh, green notes. So that is what curators are supposed to smell like. Oh, I love it! This so is also, um, do uh, write in and let us know what you think uh, conservators smell like and what a conservator perfume would smell like. Oh, because yeah. I'd be really interested to know. They will be really interested now. Oh, it's probably like it's wool nice. and acetone, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we both sit here but jenny and i sit here in rather lovely purple cardigans yes they match each other quite nicely actually (laughs) oh mine's gray (laughs) oh we're still with the world hashtag knitwear here yeah (laughs) Mm -mm. hashtag some knitwear (laughs) all things knitwear Uh, any more news oh god that was amazing uh no Uh, so i i guess i guess on the slightly um slightly esoteric side of things i've uh i'm quite chuffed because i just presented a paper and i that's like a big thing for me because I, I haven't really done that very much so uh, i went to the seroplastics international congress on wax modeling uh, and presented Ooh, a paper. Specific. i know it was the first one in 40 years so it was quite special and it was held at the Gordon Museum of Pathology in London, which is not generally open to the public. So that was an intriguing experience. And uh, it wasn't a conservation only uh, kind of event, but conservators were there and there was a whole day dedicated to conservation, just as there was one dedicated to art and one to kind of art history. And uh, basically, it was an amazing experience. I feel like I've met so many people from all over the world now who's really into wax in some description and (laughs) and you know it's kind of intriguing how many things there are that are made of wax because a lot of the focus here was on medical kind of uh, modeling so dissection models and models of organs and that sort of thing so quite quite grim stuff um and i think it, it tested all of us in terms of how much we could stomach in a day in terms of pictures <laughs> <laughs> of a very very grisly diseases and body parts however uh it did cover other things as well so you know wax seals wax dolls that sort of thing so it, it really covered a lot of ground and it was really really fascinating there were loads of good talks about treatments and storage solutions and how to best clean it and support it and all sorts, really. It was really, really good. And uh, yeah, if anyone wants to pick my brains about it, you know, get in touch because I've got extensive notes. <laughs> well done. And it was cool. really, really good three days. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Hooray! Yay! <laughs> now, speaking of conservation news... Yes, so uh, this week, the week beginning uh, September, uh, conservation has been in the news very heavily in the Northwest, particularly um, in the People's History Museum. So the People's History Museum has recently uh, discovered and acquired a really amazing suffragette banner with strong links to Emmeline Pankhurst and its use around Manchester. And the news featured... (coughs) <coughs> the, their conservator and their conservation team mm-hmm. um, and talked to the the curators and the, the historians at the People's History Museum um, but were also genuinely interested in conservation and storage and, you know, environmental conditions and all of those things. So there have been some really nice interviews coming out from the conservation perspective. <coughs> and, and in no way does this feature a familiar voice or face. None. Like, I, yeah, I don't I don't really know. Uh, no, no, uh, you've got no insight into this project no. whatsoever. Um, but it's been very exciting. Cool. And look at uh, I hope any conservators listening to this who saw it gave a little cheer of, I know those gloves, I have those gloves, or brilliant, <laughs> you know, <laughs> conservation in the news kind of thing. Uh, yes, that's true. It's been, it's been very heavily featured. Yeah, you don't places. get that very much and no, I was, I was really, really, really impressed because yeah. it's normally we've talked to the curator or we've talked to the director of the museum it's like yeah, yeah but it, you know 
that's how, how else how else do you talk to a museum about yeah an object although it would be nice if they could spell your name right <laughs> whose name <laughs> oh no i mean uh, nothing <laughs> nothing disregard that entirely um anyway yes that's really good because generally if you see any conservation news it tends to be very you know hey big museum in london does a thing yeah exactly if you even see that yeah so it's it's been a it's been a good good uh conservation news week in that way whoop, 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 whoop. it's excellent so uh i think we move on now to talk about freelancing um is this mm. around the table is this something that we've done is this something we've experienced ourselves being freelancers yeah yes uh well it's yeah uh i've had um a couple of quite long periods um of working exclusively as a freelancer um not i i should say not by choice actually um and it's not something i ever particularly wanted to do and it's not something i particularly enjoy i find it quite stressful um and it's also not something i think i'm particularly good at um, but it is <laughs> it is something that i've I've had to do um, for a couple of years, it, it, just out of necessity, actually. Um, and I, I guess that is that is the way for quite a few people. So uh, after I left college, I got a shortish contract at the institution where I did my second internship. And I ended up staying there, I think, about nine months in the end. But after that, I ended up working as a freelancer for two years, just because I couldn't find another job and people wanted to put my work work my way but there wasn't enough work to justify a job so I kind of had no option but to do it as a freelancer so I kind of ended up falling into it I will say one of the things that kind of kept me going was the fact that I had a couple of very big kind of semi-regular contracts and I don't know how I would have managed to do it particularly at such an early stage in my career if I hadn't had that so I did I did end up having a job which um was nominally freelance but actually i i worked on two or three days a week and that that kind of made up quite a significant part of my income um and at least gave me some kind of reassurance i wasn't going to starve if the other stuff kind of fell through and then around that i worked various other kind of things i ended up briefly doing um a part-time museum job at the same time which was also two days a week and then doing random bits of freelancing going to museums around the country doing bits and pieces which didn't normally take more than a week or two at a time um so it was all a kind of total patchwork but yeah there was quite a lot of freelancing that's really cool and especially so early in your career i think that's that's uh, a really brave and you know uh, like I said, it was out of necessity. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know that I should get yeah. any credit for bravery. <laughs> and at the time, I found it massively stressful. And um, now, kind of 12 years later, and I've got two small children and a mortgage and so on, the prospect of going back to that, um, I find even more stressful. <laughs> so mm. I don't know how, how people do that until, you know, unless they've got quite an established business um, built up. The other thing is I, I had to find out about all kinds of things I had absolutely no idea about i had to get um public liability insurance um in case i accidentally injured someone while carrying out freelance work um and i had to get all kinds of uh other insurance i had to register with hmrc as a self-employed person contractor and do accounts at the end of each year so it it was quite a kind of you know steep learning curve in running a business when i didn't kind of feel ready for that necessarily and i didn't feel that there was much of business necessarily so yeah (laughs) i did subsequently have to go back and do more freelancing at another point in my life about five years later where again i was between contracts and there wasn't anything on the horizon and i've also done quite a lot of freelance work for institutions where for one reason or another the institutions don't want to have people on their books or can't have people on their books or have to employ people in a temporary or freelance capacity because they're not able to make contracts for whatever reason. So I think it's also quite common for museums not to be able to employ people and to use freelancers as a way around that Hmm. even though it's not necessarily a freelancing you might end up doing a freelance job that means you go into the museum every day five days a week for six months and you know arguably that's not really a proper freelance contract that's a job but um, yeah <laughs> for a lot of museums that's <laughs> calling it a freelance contract is is the way to ensure that they actually get people um and i i do worry about this tendency to kind of have people off the books more and more because it, it shifts the responsibility and the risk from the institution onto the individual so i think that that's that's a trend i've seen more and more and i think it's a slightly worrying one 
Yeah, I've encountered this as well. Um, I've encountered the the actual situation of it and have worked in that situation myself as well. Um, but also the attitude of uh, museums just starting to consider doing that as well. The um, that all we're thinking of of collating a list of freelancers in the of, of conservators in the area that we could employ on short term contracts and in basically employing freelancers to do the work that a full time conservator would be doing otherwise and it is certainly concerning and I find it really irritating I can understand the situation but I find it irritating uh, the the situation that I've worked in before has been not so much like that because it's been for uh in fact the the exhibition space to Temple Place, they have yearly exhibitions that basically only need a conservator for a week in January and then a week in April. Mm. So there isn't really a place for a full time conservator there because they don't, you know, there just wouldn't be the work otherwise. Yeah, and also they um, don't hold their own collections, they borrow everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So I suppose. So this is for installation and deinstallation. Yeah, presumably. yeah, for the of exhibition. exhibitions. Yeah, yeah. So that's what that's how I've worked in freelance before, and encountered the the problems of you know how do you do pricing and the finding out the value of working within a a freelance team that you're familiar with. Otherwise, you've got the constant changeover of staff, and nobody knows exactly how it works and what they're doing, um, even if they are you know highly skilled professional freelancers. But I've also you know encountered problems of because it's such a small period of time if I wasn't able to do a do something to do a a stint at it I also had the obligation to find an alternative conservator Mm. um, because though I wasn't employed full-time or permanently or anything like that I was kind of the go-to person so if also, I couldn't do it, then it's sort of... Ah, so it's, it's a kind of loyalty towards... Yeah, uh, it's an, a loyalty. A kind of steady customer where it's like, okay, I'll try to fix your problem for you even if I can't do it myself. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And I think that's... Maybe people have encountered this quite a lot before. And do you, did you find that, Christina, that when you had um, sort of repeat customers, as it were, that you mm. felt a loyalty to them and a loyalty to help them out? Yeah, I did. And I also had that kind of fear that the work would dry up. And if I ever said no to anything, then no one would ever offer me any work yeah. ever again. So I did also feel an obligation to say yes and to make something happen, even if it wasn't necessarily a very convenient time or it kind of overlapped with other things and so on. And I think that's that's partly because I didn't feel I was established enough to be able to call, call the shots in that way and maybe if I'd been running a business for more time and had my own lab somewhere and could kind of pick and choose the workflow and that kind of thing I I might have felt more able to do that but as it was the work kind of came in big spurts (laughs) I was massively overworked and stressed some of the time and slightly twiddling my thumbs the rest of the time and it it didn't I I didn't ever kind of get to that point where I was it was basically just a nine-to-five job um, but that that might just be me. And I think the other thing is um, an objects conservator. And I think it's possibly slightly harder to run a freelance business as an objects conservator um, without a lot of input from museums. I um, wondered I that as well. Uh, uh, though, please do write in and write in and, and contradict <laughs> me if you're an objects conservator in private practice and think that's not true. But it seems to me that um, for people who do paintings or books or works of art on paper or whatever there's a lot more of that kind of stuff in private ownership and so um that you'll probably always find lots of private clients who have paintings that need conservation or cleaning or whatever whereas that's not necessarily the case for an object conservator and particularly not one like me who certainly in the early part of my career specialized in antiquities conservation i mean virtually nobody has antiquities in private ownership (laughs) so then you find that you are also very dependent on institutions for work rather than being able to go out and tout for business. I have this in my notes, actually, that uh, one of the questions I wanted to raise was, is it more common for specialists to be freelancers over the general objects conservators? Because I feel like I've encountered a lot of, you know, textiles, paper, paintings, ceramics, ceramics, conservation, but not, you know, I only know of one general objects conservator. Mm. Can we do some? Has there been research on this? Can we do some research on on the the oh, that's, split? That's, that's interesting. Okay, so this is something um, 
this has been on my mind as well and that you do tend to see people who are very specialized you know you see the rock stars of conservation which tend to be you know no offense but paintings conservators uh, <laughs> uh, tend to be, you know they're like big fancy studios with loads of money um and you know that sort of thing uh, there's a lot of money in art though yeah maybe that yeah. has something to do with it yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. the, there is the whole clientele issue. It is a lot more uncommon. Yeah. You're right. And and there are a lot of, it seems to me, a lot of paintings and paper conservators in private practice. Um, it would be really interesting to try and get the data from the Conservation Register on this, actually, about the type of businesses and their uh, yeah. Kind of relative Yeah, that, that would be interesting. And also, so how many that them, also how many of them are one-man bands and how many of them are studios that actually employ people Ooh. because that's yeah uh, of course a very different scale of of stuff yes. because this is something <laughs> as so my other half is not a conservator at all but he runs a small business and sometimes people ask him well why don't you have an employee who helps you with these bits so that you could be more efficient and the answer there is it's really expensive to have an employee it's a lot of paperwork and it's an awful lot of overheads so it's much more than just paying them a wage so the same problem would obviously apply to a conservation studio you'd have to make so much money and be guaranteed to make that money to be even able to remotely consider having an employee so it's it will be interesting it might work differently if you're in a partnership uh, so if you're like two or three conservators setting up together that might work differently because you're all in it together and you're not technically yeah that spreads each other's the load yeah employees yeah but um having someone actually as an employee is a lot of money and that's a lot of financial burden so you'd have to have a really steady pace of business coming through your doors and pretty much be able to guarantee that to have that person oh, that'd be another thing to research wouldn't it how how many of the of the non-paintings conservators are freelance individuals yeah rather than freelance yeah, uh, so that, companies. That's, yeah, that's that's an interesting. One. Obviously, there are um, uh, established companies. Obviously, because we all know a few, I think. And I, I, I have no insight into how they operate or you know what their profits are or anything. That's a bit invasive to ask as well. There are, of course, successful companies and stuff like that. But it would, I would suspect that the vast majority of uh, freelance conservators would be solo, presumably sole traders. Yeah. yeah. So this is anecdotal again, but I do actually know um, a few conservators who are sole traders that in private practice, but who take on people. They kind of subcontract work. Mm, when yeah, times are busy so thing. it's not like employing another person but it's they take on an assistant if you like or another freelance conservator yes. to work for them with them I'm not entirely sure of the exact relationship um for maybe a couple of months just to take on all the excess work when there's a lot going on or to help with a job that needs two people or that kind of thing so that's that's also i think a way in which the work kind of gets distributed so going back to just workload because christina you mentioned that you were very busy in some in, during some periods and not so busy during mm -hmm. others so i'm not a freelancer i have freelanced a little bit uh actually with chloe uh, in Yay. the capacity of uh temporary exhibitions conservators but uh, i'm not freelance now but i do work uh commercially part of part of the time and it's kind of adjacent to freelancing in that i'm the business so you know it's uh, it's a one-man band again but i also notice that there will be some very busy periods and then odd periods of downtime and it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to space out and i'm very curious to hear from other people if they also feel like there are cycles and this sort of thing i don't i'm not after details about what the cycles are because i can just observe what i get in my in my client area but it's it's an interesting notion that work comes in waves and it's not necessarily steady i'd I'd love to hear from people who do have steady work. I mean, that would be amazing just to just to know that that exists. I have certainly ob observed that things kind of come and go and suddenly it's like three people wanting things done by, you know, end of such and such. And then it'll be three months where nobody talks to you. And then suddenly, oh my God, please do this thing. Um, which is a weird and hectic way to live your life. So I, th I think I touched on this earlier, but my suspicion is that nobody has a steady flow of work that kind of where the next job presents itself just as you're finishing the last yeah. one <laughs> but uh, my impression is that the people who have got the very well established businesses so they've been working as paper conservator for 20 years they've got a very 
good reputation and a wide client base. It seems to me that uh, although the work doesn't present itself steadily, they're in a much better position to be able to space it out themselves by saying to clients, well, I can't do it now, but I can do it in two weeks time. So leave it with me and I'll do it then. And mm. so they, they're, I think they probably space their work out themselves rather than the work coming steadily. Does that make sense? But I also think you can only afford to you can only afford to be able to do that and to sort of essentially delay clients and, and work to your deadlines and not to theirs when you're in that position of power. Uh, yeah, when, yeah. when you're the one with That's... the well established business and you've got something that they want more than they've got something that you want. That's an interesting notion as well, because I guess it depends on who your clients are as well. So again we come back to uh, the kind of audience that you're catering to because if it's a private collectors I would imagine they would be quite happy to say okay that's fine if you can only do this in two months time mm-hmm. that's absolutely fine I'm happy to wait as for a institution saying we need this for an exhibition deadline that happens to match up with all the other exhibition deadlines that you're already <laughs> working to you know they're, yeah, they're not, sure. not going to wait right so there's also a lot of sometimes you can't negotiate sometimes it's you either take this job or you don't and uh, that that must be extra stressful in a, in a freelance capacity. Also, interestingly, uh, we should note that we did ask on Twitter uh, about uh, f- what freelance conservators kind of had in terms of challenges and stuff. And one thing that some that a couple of people said was that we we don't all like the term freelance. Some people prefer being consultants. Uh, others Ooh. prefer being independent conservators as opposed to freelance. And I I just thought that was interesting. I don't no because english isn't my first language if they carry different connotations to different people uh because to me all of those things are on par with each other they're all professional they're all they, they all carry the same connotation in my head but i realized that i might have a skewed view of that so i was just curious to see if the two of you had different thoughts on that if there is a difference in <laughs> a subtle difference in connotation then it's not one i'm aware of and okay. i'd love it if the people who who feel that there is could kind of clarify actually yeah i'd be interested to hear that as well i think the only thing that i can think is that f- potentially freelance sounds possibly a little bit more sort of f- flighty and not st- stuck down so I suppose ever so slight connotations towards less professional. But oh, then that's the only thing I can think of. Mm, interesting. More like rogue. But I don't... <laughs> Gun for hire. <laughs> Scalpel for hire. Yeah, yeah. I mean, potentially, yeah. potentially, but then... I, I was just genuinely curious if I was missing some sort of subtle nuance there. But but fair enough. And please do write in and or like talk to us on Twitter or something because I'd I'd, uh, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are uh, on that. Yeah. Uh, so I have some interesting things to say. Well, I think they're interesting. <laughs> yeah. Go on. I have some things to say <laughs> about working with freelancers, consultants, or independent conservators. Um, <laughs> let's just stick to freelancers. Yeah, let's not let's make just, it just, too yeah. Um, about my experiences of working alongside freelancers Mm -hmm. um so i've worked before alongside particular conservator as basically an extra pair of hands um he was doing a job and knew i needed money basically (laughs) and there was work to be done so i went along on a trip with this conservator and i found the experience really really brilliant because i was basically even though i didn't go on into all that much freelancing it was basically brilliant to learn the ropes in a very basic simple basic way of learn the ropes learn how to be a professional learn how to behave around your client and how to professionally discuss costings and you know future work past work that sort of thing so i think that's a really valuable thing to do if you if you are interested in taking up uh, work as a as a freelance conservator if you know if you can build relationships with other freelancers i know it's a competitive world but if into relationships between freelancers professionally is probably very very valuable even if it's you know just can i shadow you or how do you do this or how does this work out kind of thing um so i found that really really insightful the other thing i've noticed with seeing freelancers work is really fantastic equipment hacks Oh. That I didn't expect. <laughs> um, oh, and it please prob- give us an example. Well, so um, it probably has. I suspect it probably has to do with um, the the type of 
obviously the type of freelance conservator are you working one place do you go out or do people come to you kind of thing um but in terms of the people who go out i've seen some fantastic like uh platforms and access ladder things that are you know comply with all the regulations but are really easy to move around and cheap to get hold of um particularly recently i worked alongside a paper conservator and her little travel lab is the best thing i've ever seen it was like the tiniest cutting board i've ever seen the tiniest little uh, ruler and of course that's all you need if you're working on small scale like that and then amazingly a sieve and i didn't know at the time that you sieve your pastes i do now now know that you sieve pastes using a a loose tea a loose leaf tea uh strainer grabber thing yeah as I got one in the kitchen. As your paste, as your paste sieve, Aww, which is totally cool. amazing because you don't have to carry it around if it's giant, and it's not a pain in the ass to wash up. Oh, I love it, and it's just amazing. And it doesn't like if you wash up a sieve, it's always wet for ages, isn't it? So you don't yeah. have to pack it away wet. Hey, nice, it's totally brilliant. Yeah, that's true. So oh, that I was re- that I was I was enamoured with this oh. sort of thing. So I think please tell us, t- please tell us your favourite. Yeah, if you have tool hacks. some <laughs> amazing tool hacks. Because I suspect them. you do. Mm-hmm. Please tell us, because they're brilliant. And I find them more, even more exciting than IKEA hacks. Right. I was just going to say on the topic of net... No, not networking and such, but yeah, staying in touch with other freelancers. Um, there is something on LinkedIn uh, called the uh, Museum Freelancers Network UK. Uh, that's a LinkedIn group. Uh, now, that's not conservation only, but it is Museum Freelancers. It has 500 odd members at the moment. Um, so that's a kind of discussion group where you can hang out and ask questions and uh, you know exchange tips with other museum professionals Uh, and hopefully that will grow Uh, they're also on twitter as museum freelance uh, and they do freelance hour and all sorts of stuff really so um, uh, that that's just a, a little pro tip there isn't a specific one for conservators as far as i know but the fact that there is one for heritage freelancers is beautiful and uh, we should probably all join if we're interested in in that sort of thing so talking of networking we actually um asked around some freelancers of our acquaintance some conservation consultants of our acquaintance um some kind of questions about their practice and so on and one of the things we did ask was whether they felt isolated from or, or part of the profession yeah and interestingly a lot of people said they felt isolated but only because of geography yes but they I still felt that. kind of linked into the profession as a whole and um, part of it very much part of it i was quite heartened that people did still feel connected to the profession and i guess it is is this kind of more online availability yeah is, is really helping I, with I, that. I i definitely pegged that as a thing that i thought people would struggle a lot more with because having mm-hmm. having a lot of friends who are small business owners and you know independent traders in some some form they always say that the difficulty is hey we work from home we work from our own studio we don't have colleagues so it's difficult you know meeting people and talking to people and uh, feeling like you're not socially isolated so it was really nice to see that 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 didn't seem to be the case at least with the people who who got back to us and that that's really good and hopefully that is because there's a lot of online community going on and there are people you can reach out to and talk to in other ways uh, than just meeting in person um and also it's it's worth it's worth saying that even though we all say that we're in competition with each other are we really because we're all slightly different um and some Mm. people are specialists and some people are generalists and even if you're a general object conservator you probably don't have the same special skills that that other person does who's also an object conservator ultimately you know we pretend like if we're fighting for the same crumbs but actually i think it's it's doesn't have that amount of overlap it might be hey i actually need this fancy painting conserved do you know anyone i i do know someone and it's not me <laughs> you know <laughs> I, I'm, I guess i'm just trying to say um we think we're all in competition with each other but i think it might not be quite as fierce i guess as cut cut. yeah <laughs> mm, yeah. yeah nice yeah that was just a thought but yeah so we did ask uh some more questions like how did people start as working as freelance conservators um, and the the answers were quite varied. So um, someone said that they actually freelanced within curatorial and collection stuff before they became a conservator. Something I noticed in these answers was that 
sometimes it was just I was kind of forced into it because the jobs yeah. <laughs> weren't there or um, I was having children and I needed to be more flexible with my work and a steady, a regular job wouldn't let me do that or that sort of thing, which I, I just thought was vaguely interesting. So we also asked what the positives and the negatives were. And uh, lots of people, people felt that some of the positives were that kind of freedom that comes with this. You can choose your own type of work. You can, to some extent, choose how much work you take on and when you do it and so on. Um, it's interesting. It's varied, um, very flexible hours. I think a couple of people mentioned having young children and being able to work around that and uh, it's still the case actually which is kind of weird for a female dominated profession that institutions are often quite reluctant to offer part-time work or flexible working yes. so um, I can see yeah. that freelancing if you're in that position is is that's one of the big positives of being a freelancer um, as, as someone says you're master of your own time yeah and then um, uh, I, I, I also noticed that people um, mentioned they uh, they didn't have to commute or if they had to travel it might be for a shorter time um, or you know for a specific project um, and I love that someone said confidence confidence was one of the po positives because they they're so much more confident as a professional now and that just made me happy it was like oh that's great <laughs> well done uh, yeah that just made me happy freedom also not only to um, do the work not not only freedom to arrange how you do the work and when you do it and so on but somebody also mentioned freedom in in the choices you make about what you do so um, they mentioned um, that there's a lot you can't do when working in an institution as much as this is governed by policy and when you're a freelancer the same rules and ethics apply but there's a higher level of intervention and so they, they felt they were kind of getting to use all of that kind of practical stuff yeah, that's an interesting one. More restoration. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, institutions are often doing quite kind of minimal collections care mm. um, rather than interventive conservation, often because of resources um, where you've got huge collections, you can't afford to treat all of the objects. And sometimes it's a matter of policy as well. So I can yeah. see if, if you really kind of enjoy all that really hands on craft based bench stuff, then being a freelancer could be very satisfying. Uh, challenges. Uh, insecurity yeah uh, not enough money not enough work doing taxes no holiday pay no sickness pay no pension and um, that is obviously one of the really big downsides um, for not being employed um, and also and no maternity leave <laughs> like not paid anyway no maternity leave. yeah absolutely and you know if, if you had a long period of sick leave your business could collapse um, yeah. potentially not only would you not receive any sick pay uh i guess you might get the statutory minimum but certainly no kind of enhanced sick pay but also if if nobody's running your business that could be enough to make it fail as well so i think it, it, there's a, there's definitely a sense that it's quite precarious i actually um talked to someone who is now working for an archives uh, as an archives conservator who was previously running a business and um, made a difficult decision to stop running a business a few years ago as there just was not enough work coming in to cover the costs of insurance and paying the accountant. Yeah, no, um, I've heard that as well. And, and she says, I always had a steady trickle of work coming in such that I always had a job on the go, but this dried up slowly after the crash of 2008. I ran mm. the practice at a loss for a few years, hoping that it might pick up again, but it didn't. Um, and I was finding that working from home with a small child was really difficult. <laughs> so yeah. um, now her child's, her son's a teenager, her child is a teenager and she's thinking about, um, and she's, she's looking for more work and thinking about starting private practice again, but mm. thinking about doing it differently this time. So offering more of an advisory service rather than bench work, or if she does bench work, hiring a studio for a few hours a week rather than trying to set up a fully fledged studio at home. So that's the other thing is that, um, I think people are looking for more kind of flexible ways to make this work, possibly around a part-time day job, um, if you can find that, or to, to make it work around your own constraints. Yeah, and that, that's an interesting one. You do see more people offering um, bench space to be hired out to freelancers. I don't know anything about their kind of rates or anything. I have no concept of what people are paying for bench space. But you do see it offered, and I, 
that's something that that's really nice to see and uh, obviously that's income for whatever studio uh, is offering it as well so i, I guess it works both ways really uh, i guess there's a kind of <laughs> i was gonna say i guess there's kind of synergy and that can, uh, museums are sometimes uh, uh, employing fewer conservators than they used to and may find themselves with these kind of huge underused premises because yeah. they've made their conservators redundant or just not renewed contracts and at the same time there are freelancers who are finding it's very expensive to run their own studio yeah um, who want the space so it seems like a smart way to go really space was one of the things that people did bring up as a negative or a challenge as freelancers uh, in that if you don't have a purpose-built studio and jesus who can afford to do that then finding the space to actually treat things can be difficult unless you're doing it actually at the client's place uh, depending on what kind of object it is so th- that that was also an interesting one as, as a type of constraint and that you might not have uh, a dedicated workspace it might be a shared one for example or it might just be that it's not very big so we also asked about some of the kind of practical and logistical challenges to do with setting up a lab and health and safety and that kind of thing and i think um certainly a couple of people we spoke to had actually ended up setting up small labs at home um yes i know and one that. of them says i'm I'm very experienced at MacGyvering a mini workstation where I have to. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. (laughs) So this kind of ties in with what you were saying about the little mini traveling um, uh, traveling workspace and little kind of purpose-built equipment and so on. Um, Someone else mentions um, having to be creative with storage and having to keep materials and chemicals and stuff away from children, obviously, which is a big issue if you're working at home and you have uh, small children there as well. Someone else gets around this um, uh, by saying, I only work on site, so there are no real challenges there. So that's also an interesting way to go. That's an interesting one because working on site can in of itself have challenges, particularly if it's in a public space. What kind of chemicals are you using and stuff like that? I I do say that from experience where it's like, hmm, (laughs) what can I use in this nice town hall? (laughs) Water. (laughs) Where all the children are looking at me. So one person mentions getting around that because she works in a region where health and safety legislation is not quite as highly developed as it is maybe (laughs) in the UK, she says. (laughs) And uh, she, he, I'm not sure, actually. Uh, And uh, and in, in, in the place that they work, it's. Uh, described as almost an afterthought great if you want to forego risk assessments but terrible if you actually want your colleagues to be safe <laughs> so yeah that's that that must be an interesting um balancing act uh from an ethical point of view as well you know because you're looking after humans as well as objects ultimately <laughs> Uh, and then we had things like insurance uh, obviously insurance tends to be very expensive and yeah the insurance is is a tricky one because like you already mentioned public liability and then usually you have to get a specialist insurance because you're working with objects of historical significance etc it it will vary and it depends on what you're doing but basically there there is specialist cons- conservation uh, insurance out there i know of about three suppliers like or like insurance companies who deal with conservators uh, but they all have slightly different takes on what it is so i don't know if that applies to different types of freelancers favor different companies or if they just give or if it's just like any other insurance where it's like you just compare who gives you the best rate Uh, taxes um taxes, and accounting right. generally yeah. do you do you hire an accountant which then means you have to pay for them that doesn't come cheaply or do you try and do it yourself um, which is kind of tedious tricky complicated <laughs> you're taking on more risk so that's i have done quite a lot of self-assessment tax stuff before it's yes it, it's not it too be, bad but no. it can just be a pain in the and you've always got the the nagging guilt of have I done it wrong? Am I being illegal mm. just by not understanding what I'm supposed to be doing? Kind well, of thing. Also, <laughs> it also can become a very daunting thing in your mind, even though it isn't necessarily a difficult task. It can build up in your mind to be a really daunting yeah. task, yeah. which is a psychological thing. So you know, again, it's yeah, it's it's another challenge. <laughs> 
I have to say that's the other thing. I I was absolutely scrupulous when I was freelancing about putting aside twenty five percent of my earnings, sometimes thirty percent, into a savings account. So oh my god, I don't do that. That's amazing. At the point, well, 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 well. (laughs) so that there wasn't. Yeah, well, it wasn't always easy because sometimes you know I needed that money, but um, I did really try to do it and to kind of tax myself at source, if that makes sense, so that there wasn't that horrible shock at the end of the year and having to pay thousands of pounds to the inland revenue that I didn't have. So. Um, you do need to be kind of disciplined as well about the money coming in. And, and of course, the money comes in, in in big lumps sometimes, and then you might get none for a couple of months. And it's, it's all very, it can be quite difficult to get that kind of equ- equilibrium. Yeah, we did ask people how they uh, price things fairly yet competitively mm. as well. Pricing is always <laughs> a, a, a touchy issue sometimes. P- people can be very secretive about uh, what, what they charge and that sort of thing. And, and, just just to be clear, nobody gave us any numbers and we didn't ask for numbers. We just asked about um, how you go about pricing things. Uh, and the kind of uh, answers, uh, you know, were kind of things like, oh, it's a combination of an hourly or more often a daily rate. Um, but it can be hampered by the client's perceptions of the value of the work, for example. I and guess I'm, it's difficult yeah, if sorry. you've got an object that's not intrinsically very valuable. It can be very difficult to persuade people persuade people to pay for a week of intensive conservation work. At, yeah, and, at and sometimes hourly rate you're charging. And, and sometimes when someone presents you with an object and says, "I'd like this conserved," then it can be a difficult situation to be in to be honest about what what it would cost. And you know that I had this conversation with with, with a freelancer actually at a recent networking event and. Um, and she said, it, it's a difficult one to present someone with the actual price of what it would be. And they, they look of heartbreak on their face or horror uh, as they go, but it's only worth 300 quid. <laughs> it's like, yeah, <laughs> but that's not where I'm coming from. I'm telling you how much my time costs. <laughs> I'm absolutely hopeless at charging, although I've got a bit better and I'm still doing a bit of freelance. I do freelance editing mm. um, and uh, training and funnily enough people are always happy to pay for the training um, and that's among my most lucrative jobs um, because of that um, although <laughs> of course you do have to spend you do have to spend you know maybe three days preparing for a full day's training so you do have to divide it by that but um what am i trying to say oh yeah but even now i'm, I'm doing some um consultancy work for a local museum but mm. i'm doing my full days there and charging them a day rate but i'm doing the documentation in my own time because it would it would just add a laughable amount um if i were to add the actual number of hours i spend writing up my report doing the documentation and so on and for a job that's basically only five days long to add you know, another day or two for documentation. <laughs> I was only going to say documentation is both time consuming and a necessary part of the conservation process. But at the same time, I think it's one of the things that private clients don't always understand very well. No. And they sometimes don't see the benefit to them of having comprehensive documentation of what you've done, because no. all they want is for you to do the actual practical work. But at the same time, you're under an obligation to document that so that anybody coming along afterwards can see it. So I, I've had people essentially saying, well, you know, don't worry about writing the reports. Yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just, just, just do the object and that's fine. But of course, you, you do have to do it. Yes. But getting someone to feel that it's worth paying for is is another matter we also ask people how they keep up with their training and uh, cpd and uh, yeah there were mixed answers things like reading and watching as much free content as possible uh, there is quite a lot of free content out there but obviously as a freelancer you might not be able to pay extortionate amounts to go on courses for example i say extortionate they're probably actually reasonably priced but it's just you're not you don't have an employer to say hey just pay for this for me it's not just the cost of the course, it's also the fact that then that's a day's work that yes. you've lost that nobody's paying you for. So, yes. yeah, you, that's that's a really tricky one. And you probably have to travel for it. You might even have to stay overnight for it, depending on where it is. And again, all of those costs add up massively. Uh, people did say that training bursaries really help. Um, so it's, it's a good thing that they exist. So one person says... Um, that their aim is to allow for just one professional development, one big professional development thing per year. Yeah. Um, whether that's a conference or a workshop. Um, and I guess that's quite a good approach. Um, but the other thing is, of course, if you're an accredited conservator, then you do have an obligation to 
show that you're engaging in CPD in continuous professional development in order to remain accredited. So it's you do have to kind of find that balance. Yeah. Um, and not to mention the fact that obviously CPD is useful for developing your own practice. So aside from a steady stream of work, which we I think we've all agreed that basically impossible anyway, aside from getting regular work, one of the biggest challenges seems to be the business planning because conservators aren't usually equipped with a business degree as well uh, or you know even a basic grounding in how to run businesses and um th- this this is a, a problem that keeps com- coming up but fortunately there are loads of ways to catch up on that sort of thing there are often free webinars there are business courses that you can go on and something that i noticed when i was trying to set up as a freelancer many years ago many years ago a few years ago Ultimately, I was offered a job, so I didn't get any further with it. But at the time, because I was unemployed and on job seekers allowance, it meant that I was eligible to go on a couple of free courses in how to run your own business. So it might be that if you're between jobs or you're thinking of starting up something, it might be worth approaching your uh, local job centre because they might have a course going, which has some foundation skills in business planning, uh, how to do your accounts and all that stuff. There are generally these sorts of things going for a low fee or no fee at all in most in most towns and stuff like that run by councils or independent business things, basically. So there, there, there can be support out there for that, just so you know if you're about to start up. I guess we asked any advice for yes, freelancers. that's a good one. And I think this was a really interesting comment that one person said, you're probably already very competent in actual conservation, but you need to have a business mentality too. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's quite a tough ask for people who generally go into conservation training wanting to be conservators, but not necessarily um, thinking about taking on this whole other side of <laughs> things <Yeah>. as well. <laughs> so um, they say do a lot of research into that end, accounting, rates of pay, insurance and so on. Take advantage of any free or nearly free education avenues in business practices, which is what you were saying, Jenny, Yeah, obviously. And then get a mentor. And I think that's a really interesting one. Maybe try and find someone who's already working in private practice yeah. and can kind of help you through those sort of early stages. Yeah, uh, that, that, don't be afraid to be a boss. I yes, love that. I one. love that. Don't be afraid to be a boss. Uh, that was probably my favourite comment. <laughs> um, um, another one I thought was really interesting was um, somebody's advice was get a solicitor to draw up terms and conditions of training. Um, when I realised I was going to have to run my own company, I went out and bought a, bought a book on how to run a business. It explained the implications of trading as a limited liability company or as a sole trader or a partnership and the importance of trading with terms and conditions. And this person says, it's my impression that many freelancers don't have terms and conditions, which given the nature of what we all do is mad. And I think that's a really useful point. No, it's that's that, that, true. That, it's we tend to be very vital. trusting. <laughs> it's absolutely vital. And it's it's something I've spent quite a lot of time with when we set up the commercial unit at work, uh, drawing mm-hmm. up terms and conditions and having them checked by various legal departments to make sure that they were all OK, that they were general and specific enough and uh, that I wasn't saying anything twice and that sort of thing. They are really important because if at any point someone has a complaint or a problem, you can point them to that as long as you've shown them that you have the terms and conditions. It's vital that you actually make your client aware that they exist, for example. I mean, I think we we tend to be very trusting and to feel that it's somehow a bit kind of, um, it's not very friendly to start laying down the law about, you know, the terms and conditions under which you're going to be carrying out the work. But you are a business and you do, as you yes. said, to protect yourself. And it, it would even cover things like, you know, when you expect to be paid after the work is done. Yes. Uh, and, and that kind of thing. And something that I specifically put in mind, and I'm not afraid of sharing this, is I specifically put it in that by accepting these terms and conditions, you also allow me to post occasional photos on social media that promotes the business. Mm. So your object will be shown unless you specifically opt out of it. You can have a conversation with me about that and it won't be shown. But it was one of the things that was really important to me because social media is a marketing tool and I need to be able to show people that I'm working on stuff. And you would have that problem as a freelancer as well. So it's a good thing to put in there that you know you, you'd want to use these images in a portfolio or on social media or similar um, and that's just a thought that I, I wanted to put out there just so you know people can think about it 
um, I guess sort of slightly linked in with that is is another piece of advice from someone was don't be afraid to tell your story. Um, yeah, I like that. So, um, you know, you, uh, this is what will build your brand and encourages new clients to trust you. It's one of the most invaluable business lessons I've learned, which has worked wonders for my business. So, you know, you you are your own best marketing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> as, it, as it were. Yeah, no, that, that's um, true. So, uh, you know, be yourself. Yeah. Back yourself, in fact, as this person says. So. Yes. Uh, which uh, I, I thought was really great. Uh, and then there were also other pieces of advice like keep your networks alive, keep in touch, show mm-hmm. your face if you can, make an effort to attend meetings, conferences, lunch dates, after work drinks, you know, and anything that you can to stay relevant so that people don't forget that you exist. That That's a valid point. If that is an option for you, then you should probably be doing those things. Uh, it, depending on if you're geographically isolated, etc., that might not be an option for you. Um, and again, costs of travel and such to conferences can be prohibitive. But, you know, it, it's 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 something to be aware of that networking is important. Yeah. So we got some really good advice from people. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone who responded. Yes. And I, I really hope it has helped someone out there. Uh, and get involved on social media, on Twitter, Facebook or email us um, and let us know your thoughts. Yeah, please do. Right, that's probably enough from us at the moment. We're going to be talking to some freelance conservators in various capacities and uh, you'll hear them next. My name's Nigel Larkin. I'm a paleontologist and I earn my living through being a paleontological conservator, uh, but I also prepare fossils and mount them. And I now work on osteological material as well, so all sorts of skeletons. So um, how did you start working as a freelance conservator? Um, well, I firstly started working in normal employment, but on uh, project work, so a year at a time, for the Natural History Museum. And I was in their paleontology conservation unit for about five years. And uh, obviously, that's where I learned my conservation uh, skills and ethics. And then whilst I was there, there was often work that could be done either at evenings or weekends that was surplus to our core jobs. And so I got used to taking on other work and being responsible for projects. And then I went on to work in other museums, such as uh, county museum services. Uh, again, I was often only employed for a year at a time. I say only, some people are employed for months at a time. So uh, <laughs> that's quite a luxury having a year in hand. But I carried on doing work <laughs> for various people in my own time, you know, during leave and at weekends, etc. I worked for 13 years in a county museum service. And finally, I felt that that was long enough to be working on short-term contracts and uh, it was time to go and work on my own uh, because I had quite a bit of work coming in. And so I uh, took a leap of faith and I've been full-time freelance now for about 10 years. Okay, wow. So you've you found the work's carried on coming, has it? Um, it's had its low points. It's often boom and bust. Uh, 2012, interestingly, was the worst year where there were many months when there was no work at all. And if you remember, that was the year of the Olympics. So I don't know whether that siphoned a lot of money out of the system and other people felt um, that work was similarly thin on the ground. But it's really there's been more and more more and more work coming in and that's one thing that i would suggest to people is that work goes on to lead on to further work so you're always loath to turn work down because you don't know what that would lead on to Mm -hmm. so do you get a lot of repeat business from yeah repeat business and uh business that's word of mouth really i hardly advertise at all so um what are the sort of positives would you say of working as a freelancer um well, working on my own every day with only the radio for company, although I acknowledge that might be a negative for some people. I like to just <laughs> get, on, get on with the work. Um, working from home, which is great, so little or no commuting. Not wasting time on meetings and meetings about meetings and all the other tedious corporate stuff that you have to do when you're working in a large institution. But importantly, it's the variety of the work. I get to see lots of museum collections and I find really interesting specimens in the collections, not necessarily the ones I'm working on, but I see things there that people haven't looked at for decades. And that's a rich vein of, um, of work in terms of research work that I do, because although I uh, earn my living, if you like, through doing conservation work, etc., uh, I am also a paleontologist and I like to find interesting specimens and write them up for publication. That was going to be one of my other questions, actually, was how you keep up with sort of CPD and training and how you remain engaged with the profession. Yeah, it's difficult in a way, because once you're freelance, if you're off doing something else and you're not earning money that day, then that's a loss of income. So if you're attending conferences or if you're doing courses, etc., that can be difficult to treat yourself to that. But uh, I think it's essential uh, to go to conferences, to network, to meet people, to learn new skills, find out what people are doing, 
Uh, I have actually taken specific courses. I've taken up blacksmithing. I've got a qualification in welding because I needed to mount large specimens, etc. I've done another MSc. Um, so you should always, you know, keep moving, keep improving what, what you're doing, keep improving your offer and broaden your skills base because you can't rely on there being funding just for the one small area that you might be a specialist in. It's actually interesting as well to uh, do a wide variety of work. So you've sort of expanded your business, kept it going by, as you say, expanding your offer. <laughs> yes. If I just sat there and said, no, I'm just a paleontological conservator, I'm not going to touch these other skeletons and this other work or look at assessing collections, um, I would have got very little work. So I do all sorts now. Um, uh, I do curatorial work for museums. Uh, often when there's a big redevelopment of the museum, if it's a natural history collection or indeed a natural history museum, I often come in very early in the redevelopment phase and look at their collections, how they're going to pack them up, advise them on methods, health and safety, all the materials they would use, how long it would take, that kind of thing. Okay. So what would you say are the negatives of being a freelancer? Uh, very little, really. Um, <laughs> working away from home weeks at a time, sometimes I've got to be on site maybe for a month and I come back home just at weekends and the long hours. Uh, I'm often working 12 to 16 hours a day, six or seven days a week for months at a stretch. And that's to do with the way things are, are funded these days. Most museums don't have their own funding. They've got to go elsewhere for funding. And it can, I can quote for a piece of work, and it might take two or three or four or five years for that work to come to fruition for them to get the funding. Oh, wow. Work. Okay. <laughs> and then that might be something, a piece of work that could take six months. But yeah. as soon as they're awarded, the, well, it, as soon as they're given the go-ahead because they've got the funding, they often have to be tied up within 12 months. But if I'm already working on several other projects that are, three or four or six months duration, you can see immediately there's a clash. Yeah. And the problem is all the paperwork has to be done, all the invoices have to be submitted, everything tied it up within that 12-month period, no matter what other work you've got on. And if you've quoted for that work and they've based their submission on that quote, you can't really turn around and say, oh, no, sorry, I'm too busy. They've obviously got deadlines themselves and have an exhibition schedule, etc. So that's one of the biggest problems, I think, uh, one of the biggest negatives if you're working on projects that are uh, of a large nature anyway. What about pricing of projects? I'm, yeah. I'm thinking especially for large projects, yeah. there's quite a lot of scope for it to go <laughs> to, to go quite awry. It's not easy and you uh, take on a lot of risk when quoting for a big project because if you get it wrong, you can get it badly wrong. Yeah. Um, and also, it's difficult. You might get everything right, but then for some reason, the project might become bigger than you expected, but there's no more funding. But things have got to be done right. And I'm in that situation with the large projects at the moment where I've ended up doing many weeks extra work for the same price. Not because I quoted wrong, but simply because they hadn't had all the material available for me to see. And it was in a slightly worse state than they'd suggested it might be. But there's no other source of funding you can go to to cover that gap. Yeah. It sounds as if a lot of your work comes from museums and institutions. Um, I guess there's not a lot of paleontological or geological material in private collections. Uh, there is some, um, occasionally, but it's certainly it's, it's only a fraction of what I do. It's mostly large museums and museum services that I work for, occasionally the National Trust, etc., sometimes abroad. Um, I'm popping to Jersey for a week later this year to work on some mammoth skulls. Yeah, but it's still museums and heritage organisations mostly. So do you find you're doing a lot of your work on site, as it were? Do you have a lab at home? Uh, yeah, most of my work is done from home, although I do, as I say, have to occasionally go for you know, maybe a month at a time somewhere or a week here or a week there. I try to do it alternate weeks if I'm doing that kind of thing because I have family at home. But yes, I've got space at home. I'm renting a place where I've got two rooms that I can use specifically as my conservation studio, but I've also got a large industrial unit at the moment as well because I'm working on some particularly large specimens. So what were the sort of practical or logistical challenges you faced with setting that up, setting up those facilities? Um, I haven't really had any issues. I was lucky that I found a suitable place with only about 10 or 15 minutes drive from where I am. And uh, there haven't really been any issues because it was a blank slate really uh, when I walked in. What I've done is I've kept things very modular so I can... Uh, take shelves down, move them around, create benches, dismantle those benches, make things of a different shape and size as I need them for each project. Mm -hmm. And that's quite useful if you're working on large things and you suddenly need a huge amount of space and then you need floor space, but then you need bench space for something else. Yes. Okay. And so um, have you had to take on other people to help with work or do you just work? No. Uh, several people have asked me that recently because I'm doing such long hours and... Um, mm. That would be one of my worst nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> it's like having the having the risk of employing people, 
Um, firstly, I can wait six months to get paid for some projects, which is terrible, but it's frequent. And if I'm having to employ somebody, then I have to pay their wages come what may, whether I get the income or not. And I'm the sole uh, earner at the moment for the family. So I, that, that's quite a, a thing to take on. Then there's a the health and safety risk of employing people, quite apart from the financial risk. And by the nature of the work, uh, because it's very project-based, I would only be able to employ someone for you know, maybe a few weeks or maybe a couple of months. And are there other sort of business challenges that you've come up against then? Um, the sort of keeping accounts, as you say, health and safety issues? No, not really. I mean, my accounts are fairly simple. Um, I don't earn so much that it's a problem, <laughs> uh, sadly. Uh, maybe one day I'll be earning so much like a, I need an accountant, but it, I find all that kind of thing fairly simple right now. Really, the only challenge is, as I've said, about the uh, major projects that coincide with one another that have immovable deadlines, but often the deadline's almost exactly the same. And so the challenge is just getting in the hours to uh, get the work done to the standard it needs to be by that deadline. Um, have you got any advice for conservators who might want to set up as freelancers? Yeah, um, only do it if you really love what you do. <laughs> and if you're happy working at home with only a radio for company for most days of the year, um, if you're going to go insane if you don't talk to people all day long, then um, it's probably not the job for you, unless you're going to form a business with other people and work together and share costs, which would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. I'd recommend keeping your overheads as low as possible because you can wait a long time to get paid. And often I'm spending thousands of pounds on materials up front at the beginning of a project, then the project might take months and then I might take months to get paid. Yeah. So that's one of the biggest uh, logistical hurdles, really. So I suggest if you're thinking about going freelance, you build up some savings first if you can, especially if you're the sole or main earner. Um, the other thing is to get appropriate insurance. And there is specialist conservation insurance out there. And they are very good. They're very flexible. And they understand uh, how odd some requests are. <laughs> Earlier this year, I had a ply source skull and mandible that's worth, well, insured at about £250,000 and all I needed to do is send them an email and the next day that was all insured on top of my uh, normal level of cover. So uh, they're, they're used to strange requests. And, but I'd also say check the market. If there are already enough or even too many freelancers in your particular field already, you know, really you shouldn't be thinking of joining that field as well unless you think there's uh, lots of more work down the line because you can't think, oh, well, I'll undercut them because you'll soon find out that you're going to be fairly poorly paid if you're looking at undercutting other conservators. So research your market and really see if there is enough work around before you take that jump. Mm. Anything you know now that you wish that you'd known when you were starting out? Um, no, I would have just done it sooner, I think. <laughs> Rather than spend your 13 years working for... Exactly. You, you get less for murder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd have done it sooner. Uh, but it, it took a lot to actually leave um, an institution and guaranteed employment because that's the biggest problem is the job insecurity. Whereas I'm running around trying to do as many hours as possible now and for the foreseeable future, I've got no other work beyond about April. And for all I know, I might never get work again. It might suddenly mm. dry up. So do you have a plan B for that? Um, not really. <laughs> 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 not right now. But uh, yeah, if that time comes, I'm sure there'll be something to put the hours in. If you look around enough or retrain, uh, there must be something out there. But I'd rather be doing what I'm doing. I guess you've got your blacksmithing to fall back on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, although, yeah, that, that's, freelancing being a blacksmith is equally as difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, that, that, that is very competitive. Uh, there's a lot of very well-qualified blacksmiths out there. I occasionally go to blacksmithing events. They have these things called forgings, which is a bit like a lock-in in a pub, but dirtier and, and louder, which is oh, wow. to alcohol. <laughs> and then you'll have maybe 100, 150 blacksmiths banging away on a whole load of... Um, forges making a sculpture a communal sculpture somewhere and that's really good fun but i'm not sure i can make a living do that <laughs> no uh, it is quite fun to be making uh, mounts for specimens a lot on a large scale but one of the main projects i'm working on at the moment is i've got to uh, clean conserve and mount a 14 meter long whale skeleton that uh, died about three years ago up on the northumbrian coast and that's going to go on display at the carlisle museum the tully house museum in carlisle and so i'm doing a lot of work on that at the moment OK, well, thank you very much for talking to us this evening. OK, you're welcome. And you can find Nigel Larkin on Twitter at Mr Ichthyosaurus and on Facebook where his page is called Natural History Conservation. And we'll put links to both of those in the show notes.
My name's Sally Woodcock. I'm an easel paintings conservator. I trained at the Courtauld Institute of Art 20 years ago and have had a rather patchwork career in that I've worked in institutions, I've worked as a freelance conservator, I've worked as an editor, and I'm currently doing a PhD at the Hamilton Carr Institute in Cambridge. So um, I'm looking at Artist Cullerman and the archive of Charles Robeson, who was a particularly well-known materials supplier in the 19th century. So I'm not a typical seamless institutional conservator by mm-hmm. any means, but it does mean I possibly erroneously think I can do anything, you know, <laughs> because I... I have done it in the thing. And so actually, um, I do try and encourage other conservators when they're faced with a dearth of jobs, as they currently are at the moment, to try a hundred all sorts of things and not think that if you don't do take one route or to do one thing, you'll somehow be doomed never to get back into conservation. I spent three years doing research almost as soon as I qualified, and here I still am. How did you come to start doing freelance work? Well, I trained at the court and I spent two years abroad in various countries, and then I took up a three-year research post at the Hamilton Carr Institute. But then there was a six-month period where not a single paintings conservation job was advertised in this country. (laughs) Um, And therefore, I had to think, what on earth was I going to do? And while I was looking, I started thinking, I'm going to have to work freelance. I suppose I felt that, A, I had no choice. And B, by then I'd met a number of really good conservators who actually were freelance and appeared to get rather a lot done. So I suppose I thought, because I'm someone who, I'm very fast um, in terms of my work, which Mm -hmm. was slightly worrying me that, you know, for fast read slapdash, but I'm a particularly quick retouch and things like that. So Mm -hmm. I thought, well, I would be in a position to be able to hold my own. And also I didn't have any choice. And then a part-time job came up at the Guildhall Art Gallery which I took, which is the ideal thing if you're trying Mm. to get into conservation, to start with a safety net, um, enough to pay the rent, the mortgage, whatever you've got. A couple of days a week keeps you afloat. And that also allows you to use your salary to start buying equipment and materials and premises or whatever else. And I was very lucky in that a conservator was retiring and moving to Italy and selling his house with equipment. And I wrote to him saying, if you don't sell it as a going concern, because he wanted to sell it mm-hmm. to conservators, which actually was too beautiful a house, I think, for anyone to be able to afford. <laughs> so he ended up, um, I ended up writing to him and saying, if you don't sell everything, would you be interested in selling any equipment? Because yeah. I'm starting off. And very sweetly, when he sold it to a pair of graphic designers who didn't want, strangely, his um, spray gun and things like that, <laughs> he, um, he phoned me up and I took a van down there literally the day before he was moving out and he not only sold me his easel and his his spray gun and his lights and things he kind of gave me his table and all sorts of other things he just was desperate to move out so I was very lucky in that I I equipped myself second hand including a very nice big easel which he modified to take large paintings so that was fortuitous chance yes um but it was also having a bit of cheek I suppose to write to him you know yeah. yes. and so a lot of it is seeing an opportunity and trying to take it yes and then I actually built a studio in the garden of my house because rents in Cambridge are very high and also I wanted to have control over it so mm-hmm. and I built a separate picture store which was fireproofed and um, had bars on the windows and expanded metal in the roof and every you know mm-hmm. for, for a former coal store I think it had been once it was rather um it does look a slightly little Miss Whiplash, as the electrician <laughs> once said to me. <laughs> he said, you know, yes, he said, if the bottom falls out of the conservation market, you could always be little Miss Whiplash's dungeon. I did say to him, well, I'm so glad you see me like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. But anyway, so we did quite a lot of work on, on the studio and the, to allow me to work. And I started off actually working um, the church where I was brought up um, in Essex asked my father if I'd be willing to restore some of their paintings so I did and sort of by accident ended up working for the Church of England and Church Conservation Council and you know, Trust and the Church Building Council all those sort of people I ended up with something of a niche market in you know paintings which are technically incredibly challenging aesthetically not very interesting. Lots of royal arms, lots of hatchments, yes. um, lots of lettered boards. What's nice about them is they're really valued by the parishes. Yes. People go to great lengths to raise money for them. And they are incredibly technically challenging. They've often had coach varnish all over them, which is utterly solid. Sometimes someone's just put animal glue all over them to hold them together. Sometimes the entire bottom has rotted. 
a couple of times they've actually fallen out of their frames frontwards, leaving the frames on the wall and the mm. painting on the floor. So, you know, these are not yeah. the sorts of things you have to deal with at the National Gallery. These are paintings which haven't been cared for, haven't been looked after, often a 30-foot up a tower and, you know, are filthy. People often, I think, have a really unrealistic idea of what freelance conservation is. You know, you're sitting in your easel, you know, discovering an, a masterpiece. They always wonder yep. if you discovered something <laughs> under something else. You know, why would you put a bad painting over a good painting? So discovering a masterpiece while Mozart plays in the background. 30 foot off a scaffolding tower where they've run out of poles and decided that baler twine is the answer for your safety. You know, freezing cold conditions, scraping bat poo off something mm-hmm. is not what people think of. No, so, okay. you know, you have to be relatively <laughs> resilient to actually do this sort of work I think yeah. particularly if you're working on site you know lots of freelance conservators don't work on site because they there are too many variables you know mm-hmm. I have tape measures in almost every pocket and every bag and every glove yeah. department because it's always the thing you forget and it is dreadful when you get on site and you realise actually you wish you brought that bit of bolster or whatever you need yeah. which you haven't so you get quite good at improvising but I think my business ended up Church of England National Trust regional museums have very few private clients and no art dealers at all which is very different from say a london free arts conservator yes. who tends to work more for the private sector and dealerships than i would so i think lots of people are really put off by the idea of setting up their own business and going to freelance work and how much it costs and how difficult it will be and i think it, it can be quite daunting i would encourage people who have just qualified not to do it because what you want them to do is learn from other people first. So I would say go and work for someone who does it and watch and learn because actually you learn a huge amount from other conservators. But I think it's a tricky thing to go into straight out of training, although with the job market being what it is, some people have no choice. But the simple things like registering yourself as self-employed, you know, that's a that's an online form. Sorting out insurance, there are a number of companies which will do it now. And you can reduce your insurance by being accredited. You can reduce your insurance by being on the conservation register. Um, You can also shop around, find out what you actually need. Do you need employer's liability if you're not employing someone? No. Add it later. You know, you need professional indemnity and public liability. They're the basic ones. And you then need to see who your client's going to be. If it's the National Trust, they have threshold levels, which they expect you to, to have. Find out what they are. Mm. make sure you actually fulfill their criteria those sort of things and the other thing is security you know make sure your fire and theft protection is up to scratch and again that's not that difficult you know it takes a bit of thought you can actually get it if you're going to work for someone like the trust they have a security advisor they will offer you advice then talk to other conservators i mean people are generally very generous in this field and they will show you their picture stores and they they will give you advice or Sublet a bit of someone else's studio for the start. Mind yes. you find your feet. That's very common as well. Share a studio. So I think, you know, all of those sort of practicalities, they're not that daunting. And then buy the equipment as you need it. Don't spend all your money on printing business cards when actually you'd be better off saving up for a really good hot spatula. Buy the best quality equipment you can. Don't think you have to have a lining table costing £150,000 straight off. Lots of Freelance conservators use good London liners, normally they're in London, to do their lining because they don't have that sort of equipment. And that is one way to go. And then think about things like what's valuable about your time. Should you be driving vans across the country to collect pictures? Probably not. Make that the client's responsibility. Either they have to deliver it to you or they have to organise someone to do it. Should you be herring up ladders, drilling into church walls, possibly hitting great lumps of granite? Leave that to the local builders you've drilled before. So what about pricing jobs? I think I was very lucky in that I worked for the Stichting College Chief in Amsterdam, as it was then, as my first internship. And one of the things which I found really useful they did was you actually had to log your hours on each Mm. operation. So you would say what you wanted to do, you would put in your estimate, but then you would actually see what you actually had done. And for me, it was very useful because I was interested in research already at that stage if there were hours over you knew you know you could actually work out Mm. whether you had some time to do some research to add some value to the report some people don't like working like that at all they find it sort of restricting and 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 worrying I actually found it liberating because I felt that it um it showed me exactly what I was doing but it also allowed me the luxury of thinking oh yes 
actually, I've got enough time to do this to a slightly greater extent because I've got four more hours. And so then going into freelance work, I already had that basis of knowing roughly how long some things had already taken. But I did time myself, you know, how long does it take me to surface clean Mm. um, an A4 area of a very dirty painting or a not very dirty painting? Because all of us can envisage A4. So then if I looked at a massive great painting, I think, well, there's six A4s by 20 A4. (laughs) And you can sort of extrapolate up. Um, The critical thing is always add contingency. Um, because, you know, I've once spent a day getting a painting out of its frame. It was mm. so rusted in, it had bolts going through the stretcher. It was a nightmare of a job and I'd put down one to two hours or something <laughs> and it probably took ten. So there's those sort of things, you know, you, you're never sure about. But also, you know, putting in some contingency means you don't have to come back to the client and say, I'm terribly sorry, I need more time. Because most of them particularly if it's granted, have already applied for money yes. on the basis of your estimate. And therefore, they can't go back and say, oh, I'm really sorry, unless there is something so phenomenally unexpected. But a lot of the estimates I did, I couldn't see the back of the painting. So I would be looking at paintings on the wall, high up, and you get better at it the more of them you do. Mm. But I would always put some degree of contingency in. And I'd also try and work out in discussion with the client, what sort of budget they had. There is absolutely no point in doing the all singing, all dancing, £20,000 job for a country house that's got £2,000. I mean, you have to try and think of it from the client's point of view and think what's going to be the best use of that limited budget. Mm -hmm. So you have to try to harmonise your practice with the deadline budget and environment you're you're working in and that was you know that took a while to Mm. sort out and only once I think I had one complete crash and burn and I think most people do and then they probably never heard of it again where I'd sent paintings to other conservators to work on and then one became very ill and sent them back and then I had to get them done with a mad panic to meet a deadline and I ended up paying the person more than the client paid me so I actually made a loss. Mm. So none of my time was paid and I was losing money. I mean, my brother once said to me when he heard how, uh, you know, I was running my business at that time, he did say, any fool can work for nothing, Sammy. And it is true. Um, <laughs> and so I actually, you know, took that to heart and, and partly became more rigorous, I suppose, but also put in bigger contingencies. And also people don't like too much choice. So when you give them an estimate, if you give them 16 different choices, they're going to be blinded by it. Yeah. They want a bit of certainty. Lots of people want to be spoon-fed. Giving a plan A and a plan B is good. Saying, you know, doing everything would be super, but the critical things. And, and the same with, you know, when you do a condition survey, absolutely putting down, these are the priorities. These are the six paintings, which when we next do the condition survey, we'll have less paint on them if you don't do something. So it's partly trying to think of it, you know, from the client's point of view, but also being completely honest. That's part of the ethics of it, I suppose, is actually putting yourself second. Because, yes, it's fun to clean a beautiful picture, but, you know, you have to make sure you look after a thing as a whole. And I think now there are so few collections-based conservatives outside the big institutions. The danger is coming in and cherry-picking. Um, and so actually, you shouldn't do that. You should try to give them the best service you can as a freelancer. One of the things a lot of freelance conservatives fear is the sort of isolation. And you can get an element of cabin fever. I mean, I'm a bit of a talker anyway, as you can probably tell. <laughs> and my husband would say, you know, he could tell if I'd been on my own studio all day because it would be... <laughs> <laughs> since I came home, you know, desperate to talk to someone who wasn't the dog. But often you can work with other people. And one of the nice things about working on site, which I found, is I would often take a team of students over the summer holidays or the Easter holiday. And that would be terrific because partly, you know, you'd meet all the next generation coming up. But you also learnt so much, you know, first thing, first coffee break, I'd always sit down and say, so what are they using for term ending now then? What are they using? You know, have you changed varnish? And one of the things you notice is that the repertoire materials doesn't change very fast in our field. And this is why you can take a break. You can go and do research if you want to. You can go and do something else for a certain period of time. Because actually, 
you don't forget it. You don't lose your ability to retouch or clean or whatever. You may lose a certain degree of confidence and need to start doing it again. But I do think something I would sort of encourage people not to fear becoming a sort of outcast if they have to do something else for a bit because actually the field isn't a wash with jobs and that's quite a difficult thing for people to have to face at the moment. And I think also in the absence of mid-career training, lots of people like me who've been doing it for 20 years, you know, it's very easy to get out of date because all the things don't move fast, they do move. And so that's one of the nice things about working with students. But until the field decides to wake up and provide some mid-career training, it can't really criticise the people for not being able to, you yeah. know, you you do your continuing professional development as a credit conservator and you go to conferences and things, but much of them are not based around practice. And so actually it is very difficult to learn new, new practical skills, I think. And so, yes, yeah, students for me, the way forward. And there's also something, you know, the throughput of enthusiasm is so fantastic. <laughs> I, I must admit, I... I love working with students and what's nice is that years later at conferences someone comes up and says, oh, do you remember working on this church or this house or whatever? Well, you gave me my first job or, you know, and it's just, you know, what goes around comes around. People did it for me and I, you know, I've done it for others and that's the advantage of a small field. We were talking earlier about the sort of ethical Mm. Uh, dilemmas or not even dilemmas really I think a lot of them are quite clear cut yes <laughs> situations yes. but where the sort of power dynamics that mm. exist between client and conservator mm. um, might put people in slightly uncomfortable ethical positions so I suppose you know I've been comfortably insulated from this by mm. by working for museums like Cattle Yard at Cambridge or mm. um, National Trust Houses or English Heritage or you know Church of England, none of whom have ever put me in that position. And therefore, it's often, you know, I feel it's a more collaborative approach. The power dynamic is obviously there because they're the client and you're you're the, the conservator. But they're asking you to come and talk to them about their paintings for a reason. And that's because you actually know things they don't know and vice versa. So I've been relatively lucky. I have spoken to friends who work more for the commercial end of things. I think when money changes hands, things become a little bit more tricky. And certainly removal of signatures and addition of strengthening of signatures um, (laughs) or or cutting up one painting to form two because it's more saleable if it's a portrait size rather than a full length. Those sort of things I've never been asked to do, but others have. And I think it's often at the more commercial end because someone stands to gain or lose from them. And I think there's the more subtle things as well, the sort of subtle enhancement of things to make them look a bit more like a constable or a bit more like a turner or mm-hmm. you know, introduce an element of potential. Because people are so um, unrealistic in some ways when they go to auction and they see something and they want it to be a Van Gogh or they want it to be a Rossetti, if you can make it seem a bit more like one, presumably that enhances your chances. I think it is difficult for conservators who work for people who don't actually sort of listen to them in some ways. The the person whose equipment I bought said he would sit there and he would listen to the clients and the dealers discussing what he clearly identified as overpaint as if it was original Mm. and ignoring what he was saying because they didn't want it to be overpaint and not feeling that they had to sort of afford him any sort of authority. And so I suppose... I can understand that could be galling after a few years. Right? <laughs> um, I suppose you, you often end up working in the environment into which you're seated. And I suppose I'm probably not diplomatic enough to work for, you know, being patronised by some bloke in a blazer probably wasn't really my bag. So, um, you know, I suspect that that's probably why I spend a lot of time with elderly ladies and people in dog collars. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you'd hope the people in dog collars wouldn't be unscrupulous enough to ask you to... No, uh, no. Yes, I've never had a vicar saying, could, could, you add, could you add Turner onto that, please? Yeah. No, no, they tend to, um, yes, uh, they, they tend to be pretty straightforward. And so I like that element of freelance work, which you get. And it's the variety, I suppose. You know, you you may be doing that one day and on your own studio the next. So um, I think if you're lucky enough to have interesting clients, you know, you can have a very interesting career as a freelancer. Well, Sally Woodcock, thank you very much for talking to the C Word today. Oh, thank you. (laughs) 
And now for some comments, questions and corrections. As always, we love hearing from you. So please do email us or tweet us uh, anything that's on your mind. Uh, today we've had um, a, a reply in um, response to our hazards episode. Uh, and I shall read it out. Hi ladies, uh, I was listening to the hazards episode and would like to add a comment about controlled drugs. The options for controlled drugs are that you dispose of the whole artifact, dispose of the contents only and keep the packaging, or get a license for the drugs. If you go down the licensing route, it is very expensive. It costs over £3,000 in the first instance, and then you have to pay about 10% of the initial license fee every year for as long as you keep the objects. You also have to abide by stringent storage storage regulations, and so you may have to invest in expensive lockable safes for the objects. Full details of the requirements in the UK are on the Home Office website. You should also note that the rules for specific drugs that you hold, um, uh, because there are different lists of substances and rules for each type. If you plan to dispose of drugs, you need to do this through the controlled drugs liaison officer in your area, and you can contact them through your local police station. Oh, excellent. That's good. Obviously, there are a lot of issues to consider here about how ethical and practical each of these options uh, are, especially if you need to go through the proper disposals procedure for all of your objects. Uh, it's really worth doing your homework about your collection before involving the drugs liaison, uh, liaison officer uh, so that you can make sure... Uh, the process, the process, whatever it is, is managed properly and the museum ethics are respected while also complying with the law. Best wishes, Sophie. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was incredibly helpful and informative and uh, hopefully that has helped someone out there. Uh, yeah. And if you haven't listened to our Hazards episode already, Jesus, go and listen to our Hazards episode. It's great. So I have another comment about Hazards. Um, and I think I was a bit controversial in the Hazards episodes by saying that I didn't believe that conservators should be trained how to deal with asbe- asbestos because basically we don't get danger money. And I still stand by that, but um, I have had Sarah contact me and she says by basically by not providing conservators with training on how to remediate asbestos, you are putting them at more risk. So more knowledge increases less risk, basically. And I absolutely agree. And I can see easily see both sides of the argument. But oh. I still feel that it's a slippery slope to okay. start to start hand you know, provide yeah. as soon as you can deal with asbestos, suddenly you're the person who deals with asbestos. But I agree that, you know, if you know more about how to deal with it, you're gonna be safer in your working practice. So but, I, I can see that. Uh, isn't this a slightly different issue where it's like awareness is really really important so maybe it's more of a raising awareness across the board conservators and collections people and it's not necessarily about treating asbestos objects whilst that is a valuable skill someone did bring this up as well i don't know if it was the same person but someone did tweet us about how um there are ironically freelance conservators who do work with asbestos and uh, I thought to myself, actually, that's great. Um, that's great that they fill that niche. But I feel like as a freelancer, you can hopefully charge more for for the dangerous work that you do. Um, and, 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 I, and I hope that's the case anyway, because ultimately it is, it, it is a little bit more dangerous than some of the stuff that we do. Oh, well, it's difficult to say, isn't it? But I kind of feel like if I was a freelancer doing that, I would be like, yes, but you will pay me accordingly. <laughs> Yeah, I think I I agree. I think that's a that's a definitely a really good point. As opposed to ten ninety nine an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think also it would be fair to say that the asbestos is still part of the ob- object, yeah. even though it is hazardous. So in order to, if you were able to conserve it, i.e., remediate it, cover it in Lascaux <laughs> <laughs> safely and appropriately yourself as a conservator then the level of conservation is generally higher and your level of collections care is generally higher so I can see both sides of that yeah absolutely yeah, absolutely and anyway we, we we love hearing from people you don't have to agree with us thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually we love hearing from people who don't agree with us as well just so you know uh, anyway thanks very much uh, again don't hesitate to get in touch we do love hearing from our listeners Patreon shout out. Uh, welcome to our latest patron, David. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. 
Also, if you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can find us on uh, www.patreon.com slash the C word and you can get access to extended episodes or uncensored episodes or more art. In or, chat. Yes. And ridiculous, you know. Anecdotes. Yes. And <laughs> behind the scenes stuff and basically good stuff. Okay. So, you know, if you want to, you can just so you know. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> listening we're the c word and you've been listening to christina rosaic chloe rumsey and me jenny mathiason join us next time for an episode about emerging conservation professionals in the meantime you can check out our website at the show tweet us at the c word podcast or simply email us on the c word podcast at gmail.com intro and outro music is spring by dd music used under a Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional music and sound effects by Callum Robertson. This has been a Wooden Dice production.